hello everybody i'm not sure if we're back or not um i certainly hope so i'm just looking on uh youtube as well just to see what's happened um looks, looks like we're back good yeah earlier on i had um uh bt engineers in looking at my wi-fi so maybe they've done something that's caused a problem i don't know but my apologies everybody for that um, I'm hoping that we'll be able to save the recording because it should have uploaded onto YouTube anyway. So it just means I'm going to have to record it and then put the two of them together. So it shouldn't be a problem. Right. Um, I'm not sure where we were. We were on a wonderful flow there, Sarah. Um, uh, and I'm not sure where we were, um, but nevertheless. So let's let's move on. We, we were discussing about um, ancient. That's right. It was ancient cultures and it was the idea of mirrors and mirror images and dreaming and the way in which it seems we're all now used to being able to manipulate our image so we don't particularly look like anybody anymore. We can make ourselves look what we want to look. And do you find that this is changing the way in which people are lucid dreaming in your experience or is it is it still the same? I think that material culture really influences the way we perceive our reality. So if you look at, I have a lot of people coming to my dream workshops and they'll, they'll have dreams now about being on their phone or looking at their phone or scrolling through their phone or getting a phone call on a mobile. And obviously we didn't have that, you know, a hundred years ago. So I think culture hugely influences what we dream about and the way that we dream and the way we perceive our reality. And in terms of, what um, explanations can be transposed over reality to help us make sense of it as well. So things like you look at ancient religions, they believed that the, the earth was born from the cosmos or that it was then molded on a potter's wheel out of clay. And then we come to the sort of simulation theory these days that we're like living in a, a computer game of some sorts, you know, with a, with a computer engineer or designer manipulating us so I think that people have always been trying to make sense out of their reality and the objects that they craft the habits that they develop create a framework on which you build your understanding of the world and the cosmos so I think it's about cultivating really good ways of um perceiving the world and the cosmos like sort of healthy um long-term views of the interconnectedness of ourselves and the rest of the cosmos that would be nice to know wouldn't it the idea that we start to realize that we're all interconnected and we all need each other in one way or another and i think this kind of unitary thinking is something that's developing now let us hope anyway um hopefully have you lost me again uh no can you hear me all right yes i can you look like you're in a state yeah. of shock because you got you got into a, a dream sequence Wasn't it? I was not in a state of shock. I was like replying to someone's message um, on YouTube with Mnemosyne. That's the name of the mother of the muses. Oh. So not Moha of the muses, mother of the muses. So uh, I think this is why the psychedelic renaissance is kind of happening, you know, because that is something that perhaps like dreaming softens that default mode network and opens your mind up to experiencing more synesthetically and that more interconnectedly your position in time and space. And so I think we crave it. Like we want to be connected. We want to feel connected to the cosmos and to the world, to the planet. And that's a route that a lot of people are excited about. And but I do think that dreaming is good, um, good preparation for those experiences, maybe they might help it might help you navigate those realms because you're more familiar with the imaginal sphere if you are like experienced in lucid dreaming. I've never taken any psychedelics though, so I can't really comment on that. But I think that that's the um driving force behind the psychedelic renaissance is this necessity this like vital need that we have to reconnect to the planet and ourselves and each other but it's almost a danger isn't it because we then start to realize that this reality is real because it's consensual it's real because we all agree with what we're seeing you know and i see um i see something you know uh you know i see a, a i don't know a little white dog and you turn around and say yeah there's a little white dog over there so we both consensually believe that that external reality is real but have you come across any circumstances whereby people in lucid dreaming states have met with other people and then brought that information back to this reality i mean have you come across that ever 
there are quite a few sort of anecdotal things. That was the thing that Frederick Van Eden was really into, is like meeting up with his mates and comparing notes, and they would set a particular place to meet. If I remember rightly, it might be somewhere like Clapham Common. I think there's a, there's a story where there's somewhere like that anyway. Him and a group of maybe three or four mates decide to meet up. Obviously, this is just sort of anecdotal, but it's the kind of thing that you hear anecdotally a lot. And of course, that's impossible to generally prove, but there's certainly a consensus that communication is possible in the dream state. And it's an anecdotal thing. It's like, it's a bit like, you know, pets knowing that their owner's coming home. It's something that everyone, even the hard nosed scientists that would normally um, disprove anything will sort of say to you in the pub, like, Oh, my dog always knows when I'm coming home, stuff like that. So uh, Frederick Van Eden, I remember this description of him arranging to meet somewhere like Clip Clapham Common with his mates. And, um, they all decided in a particular spot to meet. When they got there in the dream, one person was missing. And when they talked about it the following day, the one person that was missing said that they couldn't do it. They couldn't get to that spot. So that was that's a sort of interesting thing. I mean, I'm into doing experiments. You know, I like experimenting with these sorts of things and practicing uh, dream telepathy. And I want to do more experiments. That's why I'm working with Rupert Sheldrake and the British Pilgrimage Trust to do um, sleep uh practices, exercises and studies in sacred spaces, in places of power, not in labs, because mm. I think that labs quite often influence psychedelic experiences, experiences of altered states in ways that aren't necessarily taken into account, like it completely colours the experience. A lot of experiences on psychedelic trips especially when they're occurring inside scanners and stuff like this which are very sort of clunky sounding there's lots of uh, computer sounds whirring noises I think sound and noise hugely impacts the visual imagery that's conjured up if you're in a state of reverie or you're in a, um, a hypnagogic or psychedelic trance type state that whatever you're hearing starts to become manifested because it's a synesthetic experience starts to become manifested as visual um, thought fields, I suppose. Because mm, that, again, brings up the billion dollar question, doesn't it? That if what is happening around you in your, your perceptual field within consensual reality it can affect in some direct way the fabricated in Ray's commas reality that you're experiencing within the dreamscape, that suggests that the, green, the dreamscape is, is, is brain created that in some way it is a projection of ourselves rather than it having independent reality external to ourselves. What's your thoughts on that? I mean, because I know that there's so much debate on this as to what the status, the ontological status of that reality is. What is, what is it in its own being? I suppose I believe in a kind of imaginal foundation of reality. So I think it can be both things. I think it can be real and accessed by different people and experienced as real by them, but it's also created by, you know, I guess I don't, I think there is obviously sort of individual minds and brains, but I think there's a connectivity beyond that, that perhaps is more about frequencies, waves and vibrations. And so this is why I think that kind of delta wave, slow wave sleep is about us tapping into more of a, a collective, non-individual, non-personal dream state. Hmm. I like the sound of that. And I do. And it's one of the things that, you know, sometimes it's it's an escape world, but it's just as real as this one in many, many ways. Now, one of the things that um, in your notes, you said that in the book, you have seven stories which are inspired by your own dream incubation practices. Are you willing to share any of those stories with us now? Or do you think that's going to deflect away from the book? Or can you give us another one that isn't in the book? So the purpose of those stories is I'm really into Alexander Jodorowsky and his idea of um, psycho magic cinema and using story to almost, you know, like you look at something like the Holy Mountain and that's a, a journey through the um, major arcana of the tarot and when you watch that film, it impacts you like subconsciously, unconsciously. The images are really that. like visceral about. Can you tell us a little bit more about this guy? Because you dropped his name in there. And who is he and what kind of films? So is he's he? a, he's a, the best. Uh, in my opinion, he's the 
director that captures dream best in cinema. So he's most famous for The Holy Mountain. And they're really kind of like orgiastically visual. There's a lot of sort of sexual Im imagery, violence, blood, animals, deserts, like real kind of that sort of visual imagery that sears into your brain and eyes. So when you watch something like The Holy Mountain, it's purposely made to be an experience that affects your dreams so that when you watch it, you use the, you use the images in it and the stories in it as a kind of um, visual food to feed your unconscious and then your unconscious will reorganize it and tell you something about yourself you know and I love the idea of that process you know how powerful art can be in that way so um my stories are, were inspired by that concept that idea of um psycho magic and because I'm into dream incubation I and I'm into I'm really into ancient religions and trying to get into ancient mindsets is like my favorite kind of aspect of the re research that I do into ancient cultures. So I incubated for dreams. I wrote down an intention. I did a lot of research for each chapter. So each story relates to a particular chapter and each chapter explores a particular time period and a particular culture and the gods and goddesses that were associated with dreams in that era. Um, so once I'd done my research, I, I set an intention for a dream. I wrote down what I wanted to have. I'd obviously done the research and I'd imagined it and visualized it. The book also has seven guided hypnagogic meditations in them and they're kind of inspired by the stories as well. So the idea is that the book can take you on this um, self-initiatory journey because you're going through these different time periods and the story the, helps to set context for the research because I am personally much more into reading fiction than nonfiction. I have to say, I love reading stories. I always have been super into novels. When I was a kid, I used to uh, go to the library. I was really into J.G. Ballard, Vladimir Nabokov. I love magical realism. I love, um, I just love beautifully crafted stories. And I think they communicate with you emotionally and they tap into your memories and they help you see the world through another person's eyes. So you're already in a sort of dreamlike state when you're reading a book and you're really engaged with a story and with a particular character. And I, I wonder sometimes whether, I think we've mentioned this before, like the way that people who are reading less fiction these days makes it harder for them to like empathize and see things from other people's points of view because one great thing about reading a book you know characters the best characters are always super complex they're never really good or really evil they're like complex and they change and they're moody and I think reading novels and getting yourself into the mindset of someone who might not be that nice is a useful practice um so the stories are designed to help you engage with the information that I've shared in the book in a more sort of visceral, personal, emotional way so that you feel and experience the, the context of the research that I've done. So a lot of the stories are dreams that I had where I was visiting temples or engaging with the elements in the ancient world. So um the idea is that you read those before you go to bed and that you'll dream about them. Because I always dream about, you know, books that I'm really into. I often will dream that I'm a protagonist or a character in that book, in that world. And the research, you know, research has shown, neuroscientific research has shown that when you do read a novel, you are kind of actively imagining you're inhabiting this story. And so you have certain neural activity which would match experiencing these things in your real life and that there are these neural pathways that get laid down when you get really into a book so um I think that that can be a really helpful tool I personally feel like I've learned more from fiction in my life than I've learned from non-fiction and I think it is because of the nature of fiction enables you to like more powerfully um empathize with um, a character but also fully immerse yourself I love super descriptive novels you know when you get beautiful landscape vista building room a person described to you minutely I love that kind of thing so you know I think that it's a really useful uh, practice for like actively engaging the imagination and using your imagination and I think this is also why children have generally have such good lucid dreams because they're always using their imagination they're in imaginative play nearly all of the time and they have this ability to kind of overlap imaginative play with recognizing there's a real world as well and I can still vividly remember um 
play experiences as a child and how incredibly powerful they could be that you could overlay a completely imaginal fantasy scene with your living room and you could inhabit both spaces simultaneously. Mm. I mean, it's sometimes the magic of childhood we, we forget. And I think your point there is an excellent one. The idea that through well-written fiction, particularly substance as, as such as magical realism, you you really you have to work with the novel. Whereas when you're reading nonfiction, you're learning, you're taking information and you're taking it in. Whereas when you're in a novel, it's different. And funnily enough, at the moment, I'm, I'm reading um, uh, George du Maurier's uh, Peter Ibbotson. Um, as part of my own research for a project I'm doing at the moment. And it's very, very intriguing. I find it, I rarely read fiction, but when I do, I really do enjoy it if it's well written. And initially when I started reading um, George du Maurier, and it was written about 1890, I think, I found the style quite frustrating because it was very slow and incredibly descriptive. Um, and he loves dropping in foreign languages all the time. Dumaria being half French, he really likes to put French in, but of course he doesn't translate it because they everybody was could speak French in those days. So they wouldn't feel the need to translate it. But again, it, it does, it's almost reading it is almost hypnotic because you start to get into the descriptions and you start to enjoy the descriptions and the way the language is used. And you find yourself, you're working with the author to create your own imagery of his words. And that in itself is magical, isn't it? We're investing our time to try and understand the mind of a novelist. And I suppose this is why many people get quite frustrated when you see film versions of books you love, because you have a very definite imaginal understanding of what that book is about and the people and how they look. Um, and when you see people, you think, no, that's not right or that is right. And funnily enough, the reason I started reading Ibbotson was that... Um, I'm 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 rereading as a, a lady called Vera Lynn Flieger who wrote this incredible book on Tolkien and on um, Tolkien's involvement with the magical and Tolkien's involvement with time and apparently Peter Ibbotson was one of the books that really influenced Tolkien and Tolkien's non-linear narrative in terms of the lands where the the the, the elven people live but Ibbotson is a fascinating book because it, it's a it's a game of time and it's people knowing each other over different generations and different lives and everything else as well. It's very, very good. But it goes to show that novels were written in a very different way in those days. You know, um, the language itself. I think that's, that's that's one of the things I enjoy the most about it, because it can transport you back to a time it's amazing. It's like an encapsulation of a time period. And I mean, I love uh, Norman Mailer's Ancient Evenings, which I read mm. um, maybe last year at some point. And that's amazing. And I love historical fiction. And especially if you're reading a book, if you well, if you're reading a book that's 200 years old, then they're actively writing in that time period. But then if you're right, if a really well researched fiction book is about a particular time period, then that's, you know, I just find it really luxurious and amazing to you know, actively imagine these incredible scenes. And Norman Mailer's book is absolutely amazing. I'd recommend that to anyone. Ancient yeah, Evening. Now, um, I won't spoil it for you, but it's, I suppose it's a sort of interesting, esoteric, um, magical realism, erotic uh, reincarnation story about um, an ancient Egyptian character, but it's so amazing and interesting. There was something I wanted to mention here, just looking, because I'm looking at the little questions that are coming up in the um, chat box. And Lord mentioned, uh, what about Monita, the Roman goddess of debt? This is this is a really good one. And I think it's the kind of root cause of all the problems in our society. So Mnemosyne was the Greek, the Titaness, an early goddess of remembrance, memory, you know, one thing that I think is also super important is she's also the goddess of eloquence, sense making and naming everything in the world. And if you think about that, that's vital in terms of the integration process of having 
interesting dream experiences and psychedelics and kind of any altered state really is that you somehow manage to express it eloquently to communicate that and this is how inspiration happens because you find the perfect sweet spot of eloquence and eruditeness to fully perfectly communicate your divine inspiration to an audience and that's that's mnemosyne like summed up to me she is the goddess of inspiration and eloquence and consciousness really and then something someone else said, which I wanted to mention, which is something I'm very interested in, is how dream experiences can have actual real physical responses. So I'm really into this idea of I do honestly believe that lucid dreaming can activate self-healing mechanisms in the body if the right circumstances arise in a lucid dream and you've been conditioned correctly, which is what's happening in ancient Greek sleep temples that you go as a patient and you're conditioned and you're imprinted with this idea that you're going to receive a divine visitation from the dream healer god Asclepius. So when that arises and he does perform some sort of miraculous operation on you in the dream state, that your body responds accordingly, you've been primed for receiving this dream healing, you can make sense of it and therefore it can be actioned in your body so that it's like an instantaneous placebo faith healing response. And I certainly think there'll be some limitations as to what could be cured using this method, but considering most conditions, given the right circumstances, given enough hygiene, cleanliness and time will resolve themselves anyway. I mm. think that it makes sense to me that the sleep temples in ancient Greece were actually affected. So, so Mnemosyne, this goddess of, um, of remembrance of memory was interestingly replaced when the Roman pantheon was kind of transposed over the top and a lot of the gods and goddesses were kind of repurposed became the goddess monita the, the goddess of money and debt so interestingly we gave up remembering our divine origins for cash and debt and being um a slave to the man that is a fascinating reflection on the difference between the greek society the ancient greeks and the romans doesn't it i mean i i Fascinating. I was not aware of that. That is very, very intriguing. Um, so in terms of you mentioned about the the the, the ancient Greeks and the, the sleep temples they did. Um, do you discuss those in the book? And can you tell us a little bit more about them or the processes that were involved there? Yes. So they're kind of like, um, you know, kind of like a combination of Wim Hof. So a lot of cold water bathing. Asclepius was like the bearded miracle working God. So he was a early rival for Jesus and his sanctuaries were well established all over the Hellenic world. I think there's at least um, evidence for at least 300 found all over that region. And they were huge, expansive, well-developed, beautifully built sanctuaries dedicated to healing and wellness they were kind of like a sort of luxurious spa and you would go through various processes of things like so cold water bathing was important and the sacred springs were as associated with the chthonic power of the underworld which is known for its regenerative purposes and asclepius is a, a god of the underworld as well and so cold water bathing um other forms of purification and catharsis, so like fasting, but also artistic expression, singing, dancing, and releasing trauma, I guess, and purging yourself of emotional um, imbalances, I guess. Because in ancient Greece, there's very much this idea that health is the natural condition of human beings when they're in harmony so the idea of the asclepia is that you bring an individual into harmony with the natural elements they're always beautiful places i think we could learn a thing or two from this idea of creating harmonious beautiful healthful spaces in order to activate more speedy healing responses in the people that find themselves in healing institutions so Sometimes people talk about people receiving a dream from Asclepius telling them to visit the Asclepia and other people may pay or take an offering. Usually you'd make some sacrifice or offering. So the first things would be you would have to be pure, ritually pure before you could enter the complex anyway. And you'd have to pass through what was known as the sacred grove, which is a sort of liminal zone between mortal the mortal world and the realm of divine beings because anywhere in that sanctuary belonging to asclepius is considered to be a sacred precinct so this is a realm of the gods where the gods can appear to mortals and in in the area where you would have your divine sleep 
this was very much like the kind of uh, small area where the God could appear to you in a dream and could perform maybe at some sort of operation on you, maybe apply some balm to you. Maybe just his touch was enough to spontaneously heal you. Hmm. So does this tie in? You, I know you're doing this event in Athens um, later on this year. Can you tell us a little bit about that as well? Because this links in, doesn't it? Yeah, this is my this is going to be extraordinarily exciting. So it's called the Dream Palace and it's a symposium exploring every conceivable aspect of sleeping and dreaming. It's running from the 23rd of October to the 29th of October. And I'm working with my Greek publisher, Kaktos, there, but also we're working with Greek producers and teams here in London and people from all over the world to not just talk on the subject of sleeping and dreaming from, you know, from a scientific um, perspective. So we're going to have hardcore sleep scientists and people researching apnea, insomnia, these really kind of sleep lab types of um sleep disorders um, to things like Jungian dream analysis and dream mapping and dream work and the kind of imaginal creative elements of dreaming as well. So exploring the art and film and music that's been inspired by dreams. But the most exciting thing is that we're kind of conceiving it to be a curated dream space so that when you come to the symposium, you actually feel like you're inhabiting a dream world and you can't be entirely sure whether you're in a dream or not, because I think that will help to create a vivid appreciation for the the learning and the experiences that you'll have there. And Athens does have um, at least one Asclepia on the southern slope of the Acropolis. And there's a sacred shrine there that now I think is dedicated to sort of uh, Christian doctors and Greek orthodoxy, but is the shrine to Asclepius and is a sacred spring that emerges in a little cave on the southern slope of the Acropolis there. So it's going to be really interesting. We're working with lots of different artists and immersive theatre people and musicians, and it's going to be a thoroughly unusual event. But I think it's really important because sleep and dreaming massively enriches people's lives. And we are in the middle of a sleep deprivation crisis Kids especially aren't sleeping enough. Kids are addicted to devices and aren't sleeping enough during the evening. And every single mental health condition, every emotional, physical condition and issue that anyone could ever have does have a sleep deprivation fingerprint of some sort or another. It's like utterly vital in terms of quality of life and inspiration and creativity and happiness and health. I think that what you're doing in Athens is of such profound importance and it might open a window to an alternative way of looking at sleep and what sleep means and what more of a wonderful place to do it than Athens. You know, Athens has this this magical quality that um, they're probably my favourite city in the world. So, you know, um, I really looking forward to knowing more about this. And while you're on as well, the other thing I'm interested in, the work you're doing with Rupert Sheldrake as well, you touched upon that earlier on, and I'm sure that there's going to be an awful lot of people listening in or watching or thinking, oh, what's all that about as well? And I'm with Guy Haywood and the British Pilgrimage Trust. So that, again, is, is interesting. So you're really spreading your wings into a lot of very interesting areas here. Quite yeah, I think I found finally found my niche. It's taken me 45 years, but uh, I've, I've found my niche now. I mean, it takes time doesn't it to get um into these kinds of things mm. so just before i forget lawn has just posted in the youtube comments as well about the use of snakes in asclepia which i should mention yes. so the symbol of a god asclepius is um he's sort of a bearded handsome jesus type of dude really muscular and healthy looking curly hair and he's most often represented with a staff with a serpent entwined around, around it and it often gets confused in terms of like medical representations because this is a single snake wrapped around a kind of knobbly staff and quite often the um caduceus the rod of hermes gets confused with this so you often see on um some medical signs it will be that insignia rather than the asclepian which is traditionally associated with healing and healthcare. although um you know you could say there are some overlapping qualities of those magical symbols as well so uh snakes used in the sleep temple because they were seen as being the animal form of the god asclepius 
And for obvious reasons, snakes are associated with regeneration and healing. They have this ability to shed their skin and emerge looking sort of new and youthful. They uh, go through processes where they um, hibernate and they don't move. And then they seem to come back to life. And they're animals of the underworld often as well. And in terms of the particular species of snake used in the Asclepia, they were the, what is actually called the Asclepian snake, which is a non-venomous tree snake. So they could emerge from the roots of a tree and then live quite happily in the branches of a tree as well. And uh, Lorne also mentioned, I've talked about this before, in ancient Egyptian nightmare prevention uh, one of the kind of homemade artifacts that was used to prevent nightmares in ancient Egypt were small clay co cobra models, rearing cobras. And the idea of this is because the, the conception of a nightmare in ancient Egypt was that it was an actual kind of physical demonic entity that came on you in the night, that you used these little rearing clay cobras to deter and symbolically spit fire, spit venom, because venom is associated with fire because it burns so much, spit venom at any demon that might approach you in a room. So you'd put these clay cobras in the corner of the room and sometimes I'd have little candles in them as well, or little flames. So symbolically that represented uh, protecting you from demonic possession in the night. And there's a lot of descriptions of nightmares that sound a lot like sleep paralysis in ancient Egyptian dream interpretation. Um, one of the women that's spoken regularly on Explorers Egyptology is uh, Kasia Zapakowska, and she's an expert in ancient Egyptian dreams, nightmares, and sleep paralysis type experiences. She's an Egyptologist, so she um, translates the text herself as well. Oh, again, intriguing that um, an effect such as um, sleep paralysis is recorded in the ancient world as well. So it is obviously something that is part and parcel of the human condition in one way or another, which, again, I think is of significance. So going back to the work with Rupert Sheldrake and Guy Howard, then, how are you developing with that? So uh, we've done one pilgrimage so far, which is in Hastings, which is where I live in England. And uh, that was amazing. I think we had about 35 people come along to that. And I am a big fan of Hastings. I am like a one woman tourist board for Hastings. And I took them on a walk around Hastings Country Park with Pascal, actually, Pascal Michael, who we've had as a guest on this show before. And he's working to help me sort of look through the data of the dream uh, reports that we collect and see if we can get any kind of um, suggestion of themes or dream experiences when people are taking part in these sacred sleep activities. So we need to collect a lot more data before we can start sort of, you know, coming up with any ideas about that. So I think the next one we're going to do is along the River Wandle. I'm from Croydon originally. Wandle, Wandle. Oh. I had this dream, yeah, I had this dream recently where I, because I've, I've been obsessed with this idea of the fountain of youth or drinking the water of memory since I was a kid. And it's like a common theme in all my dreams that I'm following the stream to find this water of life. And, you know, I love June. I love like is one of my motifs and themes in my dreams is this water of life idea and the water of memory. Um, so I'm writing a book about about the fountain of youth and the myths uh, surrounding these um, waters with magical powers um, and with magic springs and all this kind of stuff. So I had a dream a couple of months ago now, I think, where I was drinking from the place where a river first arises, so the source of a river. And I had this epiphany in the dream that I was drinking the fountain of youth because I was drinking where this river births into the earth and into the atmosphere. And it was amazing. And in my dreams, this brings me on to another thing that I'm really interested in. In my dreams, quite often, if I drink something or eat something, I feel my consciousness alter. And it's like the dream thing acts as an agent agent towards transformation. So I've, as I was saying before, I've never had a psychedelic trip, but I've had psychedelic trips in dreams where people give me a substance and I take it and I have these weird experiences. And conversely, <laughs> I've had dreams where I get really drunk and I'm drunk in the dream state and that's very unpleasant. And then I was saying to you um, earlier today that I had this uh, dream a couple of nights ago. My nephew's been staying with me 
And I had a dream a couple of nights ago where I was vomiting nonstop. And it was this like really intense, weird, horrible feeling of vomiting in my sleep. And I didn't feel remotely ill or there was nothing wrong with me. When I woke up in the morning, I was like, what on earth was all that about? And then this morning I woke up and my nephew had been out drinking and he had chanted all over my living room. And I was like, is that a precognitive dream or was that? I was, my higher self was aware that that might be about to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is one of the most bizarre and interesting uh, evidence of precognitive dreaming I think I've I've ever come across. But then again, it's fairly visceral and fairly direct. And I notice actually that um, Anthony 1969 has asked us the question and said, in the last few weeks, I've been remembering all my dreams and they've been coming true within a few days, not straightforward like in a movie. That's a very interesting comment, isn't it, about precognitive dreaming? And do you touch upon that at all or the mechanisms whereby that might be happening? Yeah, well, that's one thing that I find fascinating. I guess if I think, you know, I believe that in, in slow wave sleep, in delta sleep, you're uh, connecting to the matrix, so to speak. And if you're connecting to the matrix, so to speak, where time doesn't usual laws of time don't apply then in that way you could potentially access the future and uh, with regards to ancient dream interpretation every every form of ancient uh, dream interpretation is about predicting the future so that uh, that in and of itself points to the fact that they had a completely different idea about reality and dreaming and consciousness than we do these days because it also isn't generally about witnessing um, events of the future as they are. It's about receiving kind of oracular messages that then need to be interpreted. So it's this idea, I guess, that everything is within everything. There's an imprint, like a holographic perception of reality, so that in the uh, shuffling of cards or in the throwing of stones or knuckle bones, you, you know, you can determine a likely outcome because um, everything is within everything. And the same sort of patterns and laws that influence knuckle bones influence your future. And there's a really nice quote uh, in Irving Finkel's book about the Ark. Before, it's called The Ark Before Noah. And it's about a, an ancient tablet sort of that predates the Bible significantly that tells a story of the Ark and Noah. And in that book, he quotes the uh, King Shulgi, who says that in the insides of a single sheep, I can find the message, you know, messages from the entire universe or something like that. I'm, I'm kind of um, might be saying that wrong. But the, the message is basically that because the patterns and the laws of the vibrations, the um, habits of the universe are constant in something, perhaps something as kind of innocent and pure as a lamb's liver that contains a perfect imprint of the patterns and um uh the rhythms of life that you can then kind of use to interpret things that are happening in other areas of the world because we're all part of a continuum as above so below funnily enough i was watching philomena conk a few days ago and irving finkel was oh on i love that, that yeah and he was on there and i'm never quite sure about that program is what the what whether the academics are actually aware of the fact of what she's up to or not. I know someone told me that they do know, and I hope they do, but yes. um, and they're told not to make like funny little comments back, but I don't know. They might be missing a trick because Irving Finkel is pretty funny actually. Yeah. Cause I, 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 I saw that you all went to see him at Watkins bookshop. I wish I missed out on that one. Unfortunately, it would have been very, well, I, I, um, we went, I went to see him with Carl uh, when he was giving a talk at Atlantis bookshop about the Royal game of Ur. And then, Actually, I was really excited because I bumped into him um, last Monday at the London Centre for the Ancient Near East seminar series. That oh, that Irving, happened. Irving, yeah. He was there in the audience. I was quite starstruck. I love Irving Finkel. He's great. Well, you're not going to miss him in a hurry, are you? <laughs> yeah, he's yeah, quite, quite noticeable. Yeah, because go going back to, to my viewpoint, to Anthony 1969, in terms of um, precognitive dreaming, I'm very much of the school of J.W. Dunn. And the idea that what is happening is that there is a facility whereby we can scan the contents of our immediate future and we can in some way access that information in dreaming. So therefore, we will experience something in the next couple of days, but our dreams will interpret that in certain ways. And that's why they need to be interpreted in many, many ways. And this is why J.W. Dunn in his book, um, an experiment with time suggested that you keep notes of your dreams 
because many dreams are precognitive, but they're so rooted in um, symbolism. I mean, I, I was used to be quite suspicious about the idea of um, precognitive dreaming until I had one myself. And it happened around about, must have been about 15 years ago. And I had an incredibly vivid dream of um, a whirlwind whipping through um, trailer trailer park and trailer homes and caravans and all these caravans being ripped and, and taken apart. And around about 10 days later, it must have been early January, I think, probably about 15 years ago, maybe. And we went down to Selsey Bill. And I was looking along, I was on the, at Selsey, there's a kind of um, a pier that goes out from Selsey. And I was on the pier and I was looking at the, the caravans that ran along the side. And I thought, my God, this is my dream. That's exactly where I saw the caravans being destroyed by a whirlwind. And I mentioned it to a couple of people. And about a week later, a whirlwind hit Selsey Bill and destroyed the caravans that I was talking about. Now, to me, that was extraordinary. You know, there's no level of interpretation to that. You know, there wasn't any subtlety about that. It was a very graphic image. But clearly what had happened was I'd I'd future. And then I saw it on the news and it was seeing it on the news was what had stimulated my dream because the imagery was from the TV news, which, of course, is what J.W. Dunn said, you know, that you you will you will see things that you come and you experience in your future as you experience them. So if you see it in a newscast, that's how you'll see it. So this is very interesting, but we still haven't got to the British Pilgrimage Trust. We've been trying to get there for the last five or 10 minutes. So you can tell us a little That's bit about pilgrimage. that. The best pilgrimages are the one where there's like no destination and you're just wandering aimlessly and waiting to see what happens to you. Yeah, so we've only done one so far. We're doing this other one along the River Wandle, I think oh, in yes, March. Um, and so the idea of that is that we use this idea of drinking the fountain of youth. So we drink from the birth of the River Wandle. And um, that's going to be like an exercise in sort of memory reconjuring for me as it is, because I haven't been back to Croydon very much um, as an adult. And walking along the River Wandle is very evocative for me. And I did kind of come to realise as well that my dream about drinking the water of life is all about drinking from this one spring in Beddington Park in Croydon. And it's become my personal myth. And I realised it was like an urban kids myth that this water had magic powers. And um, this is just something that just really resonated with me throughout my life. And, you know, I think you sort of slowly build up a picture of who you are and you're drawn aesthetically to certain things. And that kind of, um, I don't know, it's a sort of psychic architectural process that happens. I think in dreams, you create a psychic, a sort of psychological landscape, a visual architectural representation landscaping representation of your psyche and personality and then you explore that every night and you build you build it and you, the idea I guess is that you build something beautiful and you perfect that space I was then thinking you know that a good title for a future book you know discovering the magical in Croydon uh, <laughs> I think would there's quite a lot of magical stuff in Croydon I mean you know it's I think it's quite good to have these sorts of experiences in terms of because where I grew up in Croydon was so boring. I used dreaming as a form of escapism. I grew up like opposite. Um, there was a sewage farm next to us, a landfill, a main road, an industrial estate, and then later an Asda and a car park and another industrial estate. So dreams for me, they kind of, because I was super into like fantasy types of books and films and art um I kind of made a sort of exotic version of Croydon I realize now I use that as the sort of base and then I created sort of more fantastical jungle type of scenery over the top of it there was this there used to be this um water park in Croydon called Water Palace and I realized that I've incorporated that into my dreams quite a lot as well so I sort of transpose Water Palace and Croydon together to become this exotic weird amazing um alternate reality that's the wonders of imagination isn't it really because i was thinking that the river wandle i used to remember because it's the, there's wandle park isn't there in wandsworth i think mm. that i recall um so where do, where does the river wandle start where is it where is the source of the wandle 
it moves around a bit, but it's around Carshalton and Carshalton Ponds. Right. So it's quite a short river then, comparatively. Oh, good. Because it, it's very, very wandery and meandering. But I love like looking into the, the etymology of place names and things like that. And, mm. you know, Croydon, I always just thought was the most boring place. And I quite like the sort of mythologizing of where you grew up. Like I've, I've wanted to write for a while, like a children's book based in Hastings, because Hastings is just amazing in terms of weird fairy tale type secret hidden places that it's not like Glastonbury or anywhere sort of more obviously mythological there's no standing stones but there's enough magic and sort of ancient scenery here that you could create your own myths um, or base some things on the forest of Anderida that used to exist in this region there's uh, legends of knocker holes and dragons and things like this so incorporate them into the landscape so the kids that grow up here have their own sort of mythic language I like that idea because it's still evident everywhere you look there's definitely this sense of the very ancient here Mm, mm, yeah, I can imagine. I mean, there is this great feeling in in, in Sussex anyway, you know, and it, it sort of builds up and there's the places you discover. And this is the, myth, the mythic mythic of this country. And this is something I'm very heavily into at the moment is hauntology and the, the, the idea of the mythic within, within Britain and particularly within England and uh, the music and everything else as well, which is quite wonderful. Right. Well, I'm coming towards the end now, I think, in terms of, of, of everything. So, I'm sure that there's going to be a lot more people now who see you now as, you know, somebody really doing your own thing in such incredible ways and in so many different areas. So if anybody wants to, to, to be in contact directly with you and maybe tell tell the guys a little bit about, you know, the Explorers Club and the the, the interviews and the, the presentations you do there as well, because, I mean, it's an, another string to your bow, isn't it, really? Yeah, I'm thinking of restarting the Explorers Club, actually, because I was doing like a live lecture salon in St Leonard's at people's houses before gentrification hit us really, really hard. And now no one has got like massive empty museum type houses anymore. Um, but one of one of my favourite speakers is hopefully going to be rejoining us in March, actually. His name's Blay Whitby, and he's I think he's a cognitive neuroscientist or a computational neuroscientist. And he specializes in the ethics of AI. And he gave a really brilliant presentation a few years ago about the ethics of sex robots, which I found incredibly fascinating. And it was quite funny as well. So he's going to come back in March. So I'm going to restart the Explorers Club then, I think. Um, and when so when the whole lockdown coronavirus stuff started happening, I moved my lecture series online and I started to kind of exclusively concentrate on Egyptology because I was learning hieroglyphs. And since then, I've hosted like over I've, I've hosted probably about 400 people by now. Um, so for Explorers Egyptology, I interview mostly Egyptologists or specialist researchers in particular, quite often very niche areas of Egyptology um, and uh, might do a live one of those at some point as well. So that's one of the other things I've got. But if you look on my website, I'm doing some online dream mapping course courses as well in February. I'm going to be speaking at Helgi's Bar in London Fields on the 6th of February. But all of my um, events and everything are um, on my website, which is themysteries.org. I've just booked an event at um, Watkins Books as well, but I think that's not until June or July. So um, yeah, there's quite a lot of stuff coming up. You're going to be extremely busy and, as you know, your book is going to, I'm sure your book is going to prove incredibly popular. And, you know, it's amazing to see how many interviews you're doing in the United States as well. So, and there I'm it left is. Now. And there it is. Wow, wow, wow. Right. Okay, well, Sarah, it thanks. Comes out on the I was just going to say, it comes out in the second, it's out in a but it's coming out on the 2nd of February in this country. Right. So come on, guys, you know, read this book. It's going to be fascinating. It's going to be very, very interesting. And of course, you know, as, as time goes on, we, we're going to probably focus in a lot more on the ideas and things in Sarah's book as well. Well, Sarah, thank you very much for your time. Uh, my apologies about the, the, the breakdown halfway through. Um, what I will do is I'll try and edit the two sections together um in the next couple of days and uh, get the recording up from there so the next time we're going to be all together will be on sunday when as i said our guest will be um dr melvin morse 
who will be joining us from the United States, who will be telling us about his career and research in both ch ch children's NDEs and also his fascinating theory on the structure of the NDEs themselves and what is going on there. And as I said, you know, there's some extraordinary parallels between his work and my work, which is which is very interesting as well. So anyway, thanks for listening in, everybody. Have a, a wonderful few days and hopefully we'll see a lot of you on Sunday. And Sarah, um, hopefully we'll be seeing each other in the next couple of days. So lovely to be chatting again. OK, then. Bye. Bye. <laughs>